chair of the programming committee and Lewis Martin, our manager for organizing a fantastic VSA virtual convention. Um, so welcome everyone to this special edition of the VSA Overland Acoustics Workshop First Friday's online seminar, which is actually taking place on the second Friday. Um, my name is Fan Tao and Joseph Curtin and I started the Oberlin Acoustics Workshop in 1992. And we started this first Friday's online seminar last year due to COVID. Um, some housekeeping, um, can everyone mute yourself so we don't get audio interference? That would be greatly appreciated. Um, we do invite you to turn on your cameras so that um, to foster a sense of community um, since we're all in the virtual world. And um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for questions at the end. In our usual first Friday seminar, we may have questions uh, going past an hour after the presentation, but um, this is a much uh, tighter format. But um, you can always ask questions in the chat, and oftentimes some people will answer the questions you know in the chat during the presentations so our first speaker this afternoon is uh professor jim woodhouse um, he is emeritus professor at the university of cambridge his main research interest in the is in the vibration of complex structures and musical instruments certainly qualify as complex structures and um, he's written many many papers on musical acoustics they're all available on his website you can google it and um, since he's retired i think he has had more time to devote to researching musical acoustics um, and participating in activities such as this so we're so glad to have him um, jim take it away thank you fan Still a few people not muted. If I could just encourage everyone, otherwise yeah, we I'll get try echoes. To mute, yeah, all those other people. Right. I'm going to share my screen and go. And so with a bit of luck, you're seeing my slides and my nice big pointer. Yes. Oh, I suppose you... um, so um, I see lots of familiar names on this list, so uh, I think probably quite a lot of you have heard me talking before at these uh, various First Fridays things. This will be a slightly different talk. The, the reason will emerge gradually. Uh, I, I will talk about the violin and the cello, but I want to stand back a little and put those instruments, which is your main concern, into the slightly wider context by comparing them with some other stringed instruments. Not all the things in this picture, but I will be comparing the violin, the cello with the guitar and with the banjo. And there's a reason for these particular choices, which will become clear in a bit. Now, two things while we're on this slide. Um, yes, then we may be squeezed for questions. Do email me, here's my email address. Do send me questions <coughs> offline, I'm happy to do that. And also do check out, as Fan said, I've had a bit more time since I've been retired and during lockdown, and I'm gradually writing a sort of ebook. This web link here, euphonics.org, is where it is. And in fact, I'll just give you a brief glimpse of that. You go to that link, you see this home page, uh, you go to this table of contents, and there's a long list of stuff. And everything I'm going to be saying today can be found in this chapter five here if you want to follow stuff up a little more. But let's get going there and slide and so from the point of view of body vibration, which is really what this talk is about, uh, not a, um, all stringed instruments kind of work in the same way. The players have to do different things, of course, on different instruments. But any acoustic stringed instrument roughly looks like this schematic sketch here. I'm sure you all know this, but that won't stop me saying it again. The player in one way or another makes a string vibrate, whether that's by plucking it or hitting it with a hammer or dragging a bow over it or whatever. The string, of course, is under tension. And so where the string goes over the bridge, as the string vibrates up and down, that direction of that tension arrow sort of points a bit up and a bit down 
that results in a component of the force on the bridge perpendicular to the string oscillating. That makes the bridge vibrate, the bridge sits on the body of the instrument, that makes the instrument body vibrate. And you need that. Uh, the reason you need that is that a vibrating string is a lousy way to make sound that anyone else can hear. Strings are simply too small, they're too thin compared with the wavelength of sound. You've got to make something bigger vibrate. If it's an acoustic instrument, it's a wooden box or something like that. Uh, if it's an electric instrument, uh, it's the cone of your loudspeaker that you be, something bigger has to be vibrating. Right, so body vibration, how do we characterize that? Well, we have a standard measurement, something called bridge admittance, doesn't matter why, that's what it's called. Um, here are two different instruments being measured. Uh, so I'm hitting on the bridge with a with this rather small hammer here and out of shot on the right hand side you can just about see a bit of red here there's a laser beam coming in and I'm monitoring how much the bridge vibrates in response to my hammer tap uh, here you can see the same thing on a banjo the same hammer hitting on the bridge and the bright spot where the laser is coming in the laser isn't the only way to do it but it's it's good if you've got one what do you get uh, but you, you then take those signals into a computer and do a bit of magic and you end up with a frequency response plot and this is a typical plot of this bridge admittance for a violin and we'll keep on coming back to things like this uh, now i've given you the full stuff here usually you see the top plot which is the magnitude uh, the, the the loudness if you like as a function of frequency there is also a phase characteristic, just once in this talk, that'll turn out to be a useful thing. Now, let's have a spend a minute or two looking at the anatomy of this, and that'll make sense of my title. So at low frequencies, you can see individual peaks here, where, like the ones where some of these arrows are pointing, and each one of those individual peaks corresponds to a particular mode of vibration of the violin body, in this case, or the guitar body or whatever the particular instrument may be. And mostly when people talk about acoustics of instruments, that's what you hear about. You hear about these vibration modes, these low frequency modes, signature modes maybe. I'm here today to tell you that's only half the story and the other half is at least as interesting. And because it's less well known, it's more important that you learn about it. What is the other half? Well, look what this violin plot does up here. You can see I've drawn a kind of dashed line hump through that. If I hadn't drawn your attention to that, you might not have noticed it, but you'll see in a bit that that's one of the most distinctive things that makes a violin what it is. Now, so at these high frequencies, there are lots of little wiggles here, but underlying the little wiggles is this broad feature. And that's the thing that I'm calling a formant here. Now I'm misusing the word a little, so let me tell you what the word formant means. Uh, it comes from what happens in your ears, or your ears and your brain together. Have you ever asked yourself the question, how do you tell when a singer sings a particular vowel, R, E, U? They can make that vowel sound, but they can sing different pitches and yet still on a good day you can tell which vowel they're singing and the reason is summarized in this sort of schematic diagram here which i will animate in a moment um, it's made up it's not a real measurement but your vocal tract all the soft stuff in your throat has resonances they're rather broad resonances and you shift them around by moving your tongue and having your mouth more or less open and, and doing the things you do with your mouth when you're talking or singing. So you shape those resonances to make a particular vowel sound. Watch yourself doing it in the mirror if you've never thought about this. So what happens when someone sings a certain vowel sound at different pitches? Well, I'm going to animate this in a moment. What you're seeing here, these red lines are the harmonics of the note that's being play sung it's rather a low note at the moment and what happens is they all get filtered through these vocal tract resonances so it's the tops of these lines now if the singer sings a chromatic scale 
all the red lines move up. Let me do that again. Each note. But wherever you are in that, this broad hump here is still being dotted out by these individual. So, so we've got a lot of sharp peaks determining the pitch you're singing, but they still dot out the shape of this formant, which you've set with your mouth and your, your, your lips and your throat and so on. And that's how you can tell. And because speech is important to us, our brains are really good at noticing this. So if we go back to that violin response, so this thing that I've drawn the blue dashes through, it's a lot of little peaks, but they're dotting out a broad feature. And I am suggesting that we may hear that broad feature as a quality in itself, not because we've evolved to listen to violins, but because violins have piggybacked on stuff that we have in our ears and our brains because we're good at language. So um, strictly, I, I could be told off. Um, the formants really are what I had on the previous slide. I'm using it in a slightly loose way here, but it's good to have a snappy word for it. So let's look at some actual data. Now here on the left, you've got these bridge admittances from seven different violins. They're quite a distinguished bunch. There's some Strads and a Del Jesu. There are four contemporary instruments. On the right, you've got the similar collection of guitars. There's no one quite as famous as Stradivari, but there are some pretty famous names in here. For anyone in the guitar world, there's a, there's a Smallman, there's a Fletter. Um, not only that, but there are a variety now. Um, there are no arch tops. These are all kind of what I think of as regular guitars. But they include classical, <laughs> flamenco, fan braced, um, lattice braced, and X braced. So there's quite a wide variety of instruments. Now, we can see a number of things in this diagram. The first thing I see, and I know there are some people in the audience who, like me, are used to thinking of, who don't only think about musical instruments, but think about other vibrating structures. Well, if you're used to doing vibration measurements on cars say then i can tell you the first thing you see when you look at this diagram is to say well all violins are the same all guitars are the same what do i mean by that well here's a couple of famous pictures this one up the top here this is some kind of vibration measurement on 98 successive cars coming off a production line the bottom one is a similar thing with 41 beer cans it was an undergraduate project that Frank finally rang some, some years ago. Now, to fix those in mind. Now, these are these are vehicles of a production line. They're supposed to be identical, but they're not. There's a cloud of things here. The cans are off a production line, but there's a cloud of responses. Now, look again at these. Are these violins any more different than those cars or beer cans? Maybe. But this is telling us something important. Now, you know, of course, that although these differences look rather slight, they're really, really important. It's what you spend your life trying to manipulate. But there's a message here. If I only talked about violins, we'd be into difficult territory straight away. The violins, all violins are actually pretty similar. All decent violins are pretty similar. And so the physical differences are subtle. The subtle differences are important but subtle isn't a good place to start doing science. Do the easy things first. That's the first law of scientific research. Now, you could say the same about the guitars. All guitars, in this sense of this collection, all look pretty similar. At least there is one reassuring thing, which is that the violins do not look like the guitars. And that's one reason why it's interesting to make this comparison. And in a bit, we'll see a banjo, and that will be different again. So it's not that all wooden boxes look exactly the same. Uh, different design decisions have been made in the evolution of the, of the violin and the guitar. It's led them to something where everyone who makes a regular-ish guitar makes something that looks rather like this. Everyone who makes a regular-ish violin makes something that looks rather like this, but they aren't doing the same things. So let's pull some of that apart and think what it means. So, 
remember what I said about the anatomy. At low frequencies, we have these signature modes, which peaks going with individual modes. And then at high frequencies, we may or may not have these formants. Now, here's the guitar. That's the same lot of data. All regular guitars have signature modes looking quite like these pictures, courtesy of Bernard Richardson. Um, the lowest mode is usually around about a G. Um, third fret on the lowest string, if anyone's a guitarist. They vary a little among these guitars, but not all that much. Second mode is around about 200 hertz, rather like a G again. And there's a cluster of them here. Now, you may look at those two and say they look like the same thing. And actually, anyone who's thought about instrument acoustics before, if they think about it a bit, knows what's going on here. The guitar is a box with a hole in it, just as a violin is a box with, with holes in it. So it has a Helmholtz resonance. It has a resonance of the air inside. And that couples with the plate vibration. So these two modes of the guitar, which on the face of it look really? rather similar, um, one of the, they both involve vibration of the air. Uh, one of them has the air going in the same phase as the top plate. The other one has it going in opposite phase. They're both strong sound radiating modes. Um, they have similar shapes on the top plate, but they've got something important different going on in the air. Next one's got a node line down the center and, and is this cluster of pigs here. Different bracing patterns make a bit of difference to where that one is. The next strong one doesn't show up all that strongly in the particular admittance measurement I've done here because it's got a node line that's not so very far away from the bridge. It's, it's in there. Okay, guitars. Guitars have signature modes. Well, violins have signature modes. This is probably something you've all seen before. At low frequencies, every regular violin body has an air resonance, which we may be used to calling A0. It's always around about 270, 280, something like that. It has this thing called CBR for historic reasons, whatever that stands for. Um, this is a mode that involves a lot of motion of the body, but not very much sound radiation. It's kind of the whole corpus vibrating as if it was a thick plate. The back and the front are moving together. There's no change of volume and it doesn't make much noise. Then there's this pair of B1 minus, B1 plus modes, which are responsible for these two things in this cluster here. And again, all regular violins have modes looking recognisably like these. So far, okay, guitars and violins, different shape modes, but they all have them. But now it's when we start asking, do we have formants? This is where we see the most strikingly uh, conspicuous difference between the violins and the guitars. The guitars at high frequency have absolutely nothing. The mean line through this cloud is just a straight line. There's a reason why it's a horizontal line, um, which I'm not going to tell you now. It's a, a boring engineering reason. Basically, that's what you'd expect. That's your baseline. Any wooden box, any wooden plate, that's, that's what you're going to get unless you've done something complicated. The violin does not do that. Now, I should have explained that these plots have got a funny scales on them because I wanted to make an honest comparison with violins and guitars. Well, they aren't tuned the same. So the frequency scale here, you've got actual frequency in hertz along the top of these plots. But on the bottom, you've got a frequency scale in semitones starting from the lowest tuned note. That's a different note in the violin and the guitar, but it makes an honest comparison. Same with the vertical scale on the right hand side, there are actual numbers for admittance for those who know about that kind of thing. The left hand scale, what I've done is normalize the admittance by the behavior of the top string of the instrument. That makes it into a, an impedance ratio for those who do jargon. Um, the important thing again is that it means that it's a fair comparison. How strongly are the strings coupled to the instrument body? That's what you care about. Um, so both the frequency scale and the vertical scale are honest comparisons here. You, what you can see is that designers of the guitar have chosen to put the signature mode resonances in quite a different place in the range. 
they've got this fast strong resonance much closer to the lowest played note and the violin nothing very much happens um, and, until you get a little higher up uh, and that's historical things musical things but if you don't do it roughly like this and roughly like this it doesn't sound like a guitar it doesn't sound like a violin okay why or how does the violin come to have this hump here having explained that this is a fair comparison um, the the flat line in the guitar is at something like minus 60 dBs minus fifth on this uh, left hand scale minus 55 that'll be here the violin has been boosted in this range by 30 decibels now that's not a small thing this hump here which you if you just look at violins it's just there and you don't really think about it it would have been like a guitar if we hadn't done a trick what is the trick we've done the trick we've done concerns the bridge and this island area around the bridge it's the formant just as in your vocal tract the formants come from resonances so this is a kind of resonance interacting with all the little fussy resonances of the box um, this one is called the bridge hill usually and it involves the bridge rocking remember your you, you bow a string you make it vibrate mainly in the horizontal plane in the plane of the bowing so the force the string applies to the bridge is parallel to the top of the bridge mainly what the body needs is forces pushing up and down and that's why you have to have this high bridge in the first place rocking of the bridge is what allows you to turn lateral forces on the top into up and down forces on the feet well the bridge then makes a difference to what happens and there are two extreme cases that i've sketched on the left here if the feet of the bridge were fixed you clamp it in a vice and then you ping the top the bridge would have a vibrating a resonance a bit like this sketch here where it bends at the waist but the bridge the feet of the bridge of course are not clamped in a vice they're sitting on your two and a half millimeters of spruce here they're sitting on something quite flexible so actually the bridge does do a bit of this bending but it also does a bit of this rigid rocking because the the feet are also moving yes. so the mass the of the bridge the matters no, there are two is... different stiffnesses there's the stiffness of the waist of the bridge and there's the stiffness effect from the island area thickness of the top and so on um, those two things together govern this hump now while well, i've made a claim that this is a reason can we believe that well here's a nice idealized thing done in the computer this is not a real violin this is a simple system and i've deliberately made a super idealized system that's just got super regular resonances with the mean line just being a straight line that's that's this box here this is a sort of idealized well it's a sort of cigar box violin it's that would do something a bit like this if you drive the box directly you would see this if instead you drive the box through a resonance so this is a mass on a spring and we're applying our force to the mass so we're driving this same box but through a simple resonance then this curve turns into this one a hump in the amplitude and a funny thing in the phase and i'm going to flip back to the violin thing just fix that in your mind doesn't that look quite similar to this a hump in the amplitude and this characteristic drop off in the phase this really is the reason this resonance of a combination of the bridge and the island area causes this hill and this hill is not a small thing it's boosted the violin's response by maybe 30 decibels compared with what it would have had if you hadn't done this and you adjust this this is a really important tonal thing and all those things you know are important for tonal adjustment influence this hill among other things so this hill is influenced by the the thickness on the arching under the feet it's influenced by how heavy your bass bar is and exactly where your post is near the other foot it's influenced by your f holes how close they are to the bridge um, because the island bit is is rocking essentially between the f's but it's also relevant 
uh, properties of the bridge itself. The mass of the bridge makes a difference and the cutting details. And that's because we've got these two different stiffnesses which are in series. We've got the bending stiffness of the bridge itself and we've got the stiffness that the feet are feeling through the top. All those things make a difference. And when you change any of those things, you are, among other things, manipulating this bridge hill. Well, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Now, that was the, the most well-known formant in the violin. The violin actually has a second one. I haven't got a plot of that here, but um, if you drive the bridge vertically rather than horizontally, you find another of these hill-like things at five or six kilohertz, something like that. The vertical hill, maybe people call it. Why does vertical matter? Well, it matters because I cheated when I said you bow a string so it's in the horizontal plane. The angle you bow the different strings is different across the top of the bridge and the player will vary their angle of the bowing. So the force the string exerts on the bridge is not purely in the lateral direction. There can be a component vertical and it may drive this resonance here. Okay, what about the cello? Uh, the cello has three things like this. I hadn't realised that until we had a talk from Evan Davis a little while ago and he drew attention to this. Um, so a cello bridge has a pair of resonances pretty similar to the violin bridge. It has a bending at the waist resonance around about two kilohertz with, with clamped feet and it has a bouncing up and down one. But because of these long legs, it's got another one which is actually lower in frequency. That's where the thing sways on those long legs. And that's around about a kilohertz. Well, what you've got on the right here are um, uh, bridge admittances measured on two different cellos. And almost certainly we're seeing hills from both of these first two resonances. Again, I'm not seeing the vertical one here, but this one is, I think, the equivalent of the violin's bridge hill. Both these cellos have got it, but they're not quite in the same place. That's what I said, different instruments. But they've both got a hump down here. And almost certainly that is associated with this swaying resonance. But I've drawn these as if the bridge feet were clamped. Exactly the same comments I made earlier apply. The feet are sitting on your flexible top. It's not just the resonance of the bridge, the, the top underneath the feet also plays a role. So all those same quantities might affect all of these. And this is quite a significant part of what you're doing when you do setup adjustments and tonal adjustments, or whether you thin things a little or you have a lighter bar, you're manipulating these features. Okay, so that was the guitar and the violin and cello. Why have I brought the banjo into this? The banjo is interesting in various ways. Um, it's, it's interesting here because the banjo is really extreme. When I said all acoustical instruments have a wooden box, well, the banjo doesn't have a wooden box. Uh, so here it is, and I'm sure you will know this, but instead of a wooden plate, it essentially has a drum skin on the top. The top of this banjo weighs 13 grams. Now, those of you who worry about weights of top plates, wouldn't you like to know what it would sound like if you could get down to 13 grams? You can't make a wooden plate strong enough to take the tension as light as that. The stretch drum skin on a banjo allows you to get into a, an extreme place that wooden instruments cannot reach. Now, here is the data that this is my honest comparison plot again so the black one is the guitar the red one is a violin now the blue one is is a banjo the very one that i was just holding up so starting from the bottom i've already told you that the violin differs from the guitar in that it's been pushed up by 20 or so decibels in this range by the by this bridge hill well, the banjo rises above the violin by another 20 or 15 or 20 decibels, particularly in the low range. That's because of this very lightweight top plate in quotes, top top head membrane. Uh, again, you can see this is this is a very extreme instrument. Now, 
So how does it behave? Well, it's a vibrating structure, so it has low frequency signature modes. Here's a little bit of data. It's just a drum skin. So actually these, the, the modes, these, these are measurements on this actual banjo. Not too surprising if you've, um, that, that's exactly the kind of thing that a drum does. And those are responsible for some of these, these individual peaks at low frequencies. But in the banjo, these are surprisingly unimportant because the banjo is dominated by formants. It has formants and right down at those lowest frequency signature modes already we have a formant. Now this is rather a complicated plot. I'm sorry about this, but I'm going to work through it. Just look at the red line first of all. That's a measurement. Here's the bridge of the banjo. That's a measurement near the, near the bridge notch of the top string. That, the equivalent of what I did on the on the guitar earlier. And you can see there's, there's this characteristic hump-like shape that I've trained you to notice. But it's right down here. It's in the range of the fundamentals of the, of the typical notes you play. So those signature modes are already being influenced by a formant. I'll tell you how it works in a moment. But it's not the only one. Now, this is the reason for the complicated plot. So the red curve was measured where the red arrow is. The black curve is measured right in the middle of the bridge where the black arrow is. The blue curve is measured horizontally on the corner. And can you see that the, the black curve and the red curve both have this formant here. Even the blue one is showing this, this low lowish frequency form and hump that I've already talked about. But the blue curve has a whopping peak here. And the black curve has another whopping peak down here. Are you seeing these peaks? I mean, on my screen, the, the, the participants are covering them up, but I'm assuming that you're seeing, are you, you're, you're seeing the slide underneath the, the Zoom stuff. That's good. <laughs> yes. So, um, so the banjo has, has, has trouble seeing it. You need a different view. I mean, you might you can play around with view, whether it's yeah, it's a uh, uh, I, I we'll 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 busk through it. Thanks, but I, I um I'm um I say you can see all of this again on 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 Euphonics if you want to follow any of this up. So the banjo has formants right down at the lowest frequencies. What is going on? Well, that lowest formant that was David just interjecting there he's the one i did the banjo he's the banjo nut i just do the measurements um uh that lowest formant is there as a as a direct consequence of this drum skin here and the lightness of it and essentially it's still a resonance making this hump here and it's basically a resonance which involves the mass of the bridge just the total mass two grams 2.2 .2 or something on a stiffness which is something rather complicated it the, the stiffness is sensitive to the break angle of the strings it's a combined stiffness contributed by the strings and contributed by the head underneath it um, but but it's simply it's a sort of rigid bouncing resonance of this bridge i claim um, the other two formants are more like the violin and the cello that we were looking at earlier. They involve resonant behaviour of the bridge. Now, these two plots at the top, these are actually computer models rather than measurements, but we believe they're probably correct-ish. So the thing that's creating this hump around about 3 kilohertz seems to be this kind of motion. Can you see here? It's those funny... It, it's the, the three feet of the bridge are wiggling at their ankles and that's why it showed up rather strongly in a sideways measurement because the top of the bridge is moving relative to the feet that can't really move sideways very much the one that's around five kilohertz is roughly speaking the, the lowest bending resonance of the bridge it's the bridge bending roughly like that like a like a ruler uh, Again, uh, just as in the violin, influenced by what the feet are sitting on, the head is contributing to both of these 
it's a combination of the bridge and the things that the bridge are sitting on. But it's the analogies with the violin and cello are quite close. And that's telling us something interesting, I think. Now, I already said that when you do tone adjustment set up on your violin or your cello, one of the important things you're doing is adjusting that bridge hill. Well, banjo people also do it. That low frequency formant, as I already said, is influenced by the bridge mass. It's influenced by the break angle of the strings. It's influenced by the tension of the head, which the player can vary. You can get in with your know, little wrench and uh, adjust the tension. The two higher formants involved the bridge doing some deformation well you can these are all commercial banjo bridges all sorts of wild and exciting different shapes you can buy um, so david sourced a bunch and posted them off to me and we did measurements on these if you want to see plots and sound examples with all these things you can find those on euphonics in section 5.5 i'm not going to try to play sound examples here because they always Zoom always trashes them, it never comes through very clearly. But even if you... Th uh, I'm sure there are people out there who thought, I don't care about the banjo, that's the last thing I'm interested in. There's a strong parallel here. It's Although the sound is different, the sound is strongly influenced by these formants. The formants make a big part of setup and tone adjustment. One of the things you can do is change bridges. And these people have gone for quite wild and excitingly different bridges. And if you think back to that picture, like that first formant involved the ankles bending. Well, these ones haven't got ankles in the same way. It's easy to believe that those might be quite different. And sure enough, they are. So I'm coming to the end of my time here because I want to leave some time for questions here. So let me just take some bullet point conclusions so all stringed instruments have a few well separated peaks at low frequencies associated with what may be called signature modes and those are the things that say that we're most likely to be familiar with already because they're the easiest thing to measure some instruments have formants as well these these broad features um, where the response is boosted boosted in the feature and then falls off above it and in all the examples we've seen those are associated with the behavior of the bridge together with the top plate of that head membrane that the bridge is sitting on it wouldn't absolutely have to be the bridge i've often wondered whether some of george bissinger's data suggests that there may be something of this kind associated with sound posts but um that's another that's a story for another day signet this is the important message signature modes and formants those are the main two things that a maker or an adjuster can manipulate you can think about placing those individual signature modes and playing with their mode shape by messing around with your arching and so on at the high frequencies, it makes no sense to think about manipulating all those individual little wiggles that we saw in the measurement. But if your instruments have formants, then those are quite often caused by something you can manipulate, as I outlined earlier, by bridge cutting or by uh, having a lighter bar and so on. And the three instruments I've shown, now we see why I chose these particular three, they illustrate the whole range of possibilities. The guitar has signature modes and they're really important and that's more or less the whole story. There's no or essentially no formant, at least in the guitars that I've looked at, that there it may be guitars with floating bridges, um, maybe there is something, but the regular classical flamenco or <coughs> D28 sort of um, X-braced um, steel strings as a first shot they have important signature modes and that's all that's the only thing the maker probably has to think about all that everything else just flat lines the banjo is at the opposite extreme and i haven't entirely proved that here you have to look on the website to see this but the banjo is is in some sense all formants 
right at the lowest frequencies it has a formant. And the thing we found by playing around with sound examples with, with computer manipulated things is, is really what lies behind this message here. I haven't proved this to you, but I'm suggesting you, you can listen to it yourself, see if you believe it. If you move the individual peaks inside that low frequency formant on a banjo, it doesn't make all that much difference to the sound. But if you move the formant, it makes a bigger difference to the sound. And that makes sense because of what I said earlier, that our hearing system has evolved to spot formants, because that's how we tell what someone is saying or singing. That's, so we're rather good at spotting these large scale features underneath individual peaks. And it really does, I think this is approximately true, the individual resonances of the banjo, it has signature modes, but they're not particularly important. The formants are everything here. The violin and the cello are halfway in between. They have both things and they're both important. These individual low modes that you've heard talks about before, probably these B1 minus and all, all that sort of thing are important. Uh, as in any other structure, you can't hope to control every individual resonance at higher frequencies, but they have these formants and those are really, really important. It's what makes the violin different from the guitar. Um, the violin has two, might be more, at least two formants and the cello seems to have three and those manipulating those is is say what you're doing in the main when you're doing tonal adjustment or when you're thinking what will happen if i change so and so these are the first questions i would ask if someone asks me what happens if i make the bridge thinner or something those are what does it do to the signature modes what does it do to the formants everything else is probably outside our scope for uh, for detailed understanding and i think that takes me to the end so let me stop sharing so i said let me stop sharing uh, let me exit from the powerpoint thank you all right thank you so much jim fantastic talk and uh, we do have time for some questions so please use the um the the raise hand feature which um, can be found, it depends on the uh, version of uh, Zoom you're running, but on my version, it's, I think it's down in the reactions. So um, so we have a question from Jesus. Would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Fan. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Jim. Uh, I have a question about the experimental setup. Uh, do you think that uh, we can look in for a possibility to obtain uh, mobilities as an um, input rep response. I mean, without measuring the input force. Yes. What to, to find these formants and things? Is that are you uh, asking? Uh, in, in, in every instrument in, in the violin or the banjo to obtain the, the frequency response function, but without measuring input and output, only obtaining a, a very thin force to avoid uh, measure the, the force. Yeah, the, well, the, the, uh, the answer is yes, up to a point. Yeah, yeah you, you can never beat a proper measurement. Uh, for sure, but um, 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 the simplest thing, um, if you want to have something which is cheap and will give you some of the information, um, the, 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 rather than buying one of these expensive impulse hammers, well, you, you, you could tap it. I mean, <laughs> right, the, the thing I always suggest people do is, is just flick the corner of the bridge and listen to that sound um, as you compare instruments. It's always an interesting comparison. My, my suggestion, which is out there to be knocked down, is that if you, if you can't tell the difference between those two sounds on two instruments, they may actually sound rather similar when they're played. 
Uh, if those two sounds are different, you will probably be better to distinguish the instruments. I don't know why you better have this small thing, so now... Was it a case closed for a while? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But in, yeah. in that case... Hey, so we've got... let's see. I'm trying to find yeah. who's... Uh... Okay, okay. I've got to mute it. Um, but, but in that case, uh, we are losing a, a lot of response in high frequencies, isn't it? Oh, with the finger you are, yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. But if you wanted to have a cheap and cheerful thing where you get one of these free FFT utilities in your phone or your computer, I'm tapping with anything, like this pencil. It's better than nothing. And recording with a microphone, uh, that brings in all these difficulties of, of, of what exactly a microphone gives you. And um, Evan gave a nice talk about that uh, a month or two back. Um, if you want to go a step beyond that and do something which is almost a measurement, um, then the trick is to f is to dismantle an old guitar pickup and find the thinnest copper wire you can get hold of. And if you take a little loop of that, that's the kind of stuff that's so wispy you can hardly see it. All of us with specs on have a difficulty with this, but you put a loop of that around the string and just take up the slack, pull it gently until you snap it. You get it right up against the bridge, pull it in the direction you want to go, and it'll make a little thump noise. If you record the response to that with a microphone nearby, and you know it's a quiet noise, you need the low background sound. Um, the the wire, if you once you've found a suitable spool of wire that's always the same, it'll always break with exactly the same force near enough. So it is giving you an input which is the same every time so you get a fairly honest uh, input you're not measuring it but at least it's always the same and it's is covers right up to high frequencies um, if you can measure the response in a way which you can reproduce reasonably well so you need a microphone position well you could do collins thing with the little microphone that you put inside that would tell you something uh, it wouldn't be very good for these formant frequencies because there's all kinds of hot air modes inside the box that are not relevant to this. But, you know, a microphone kind of one plate length above the bridge, that, that, that kind of thing would get you somewhere that's the sort of thing that Joseph does with his hammer rig. Gets you into the area where you, you, it begins to feel like a measurement without too much of the difficulties of... of uh, room acoustics and so on mattering. And so that wire break and recording with a standardized microphone gets you halfway towards a real measurement. And then you read that into Audacity or whatever software you've got. Um, the thing to check, as so I'm saying, this can be made to work. If you want to go down, if anyone wants to go down this line of trying to get semi measurements like this, um, which you're going to want to use to make comparisons. The thing you absolutely must do before you start comparing five different violins is measure the same violin on five successive days and find out how repeatable your measurement is because it is so easy to measure several different things and start attributing every little difference you see to the difference in the instruments. Um, that's only true if your measurement, you know, <laughs> is reliable at the level of those differences you're interested in. So a, a good grip on your repeatability just by doing it several times. And that'll tell you, you know, within two dBs or something, whatever, whatever it is that your repeatability looks like, then you're, you're allowed to interpret differences at that level but you shouldn't try to interpret differences that are smaller than that. Sorry, I'm rambling on here. Does that make sense? Is that the kind of thing you were asking? Okay, thank you. I, I was trying this thing uh, every day and, <laughs> I, and I'm losing the hope, but, but uh, <laughs> maybe in, in, in another day we can talk We can more. have an offline conversation about that. Yeah, okay, right. thank you. Yeah, let's, let's uh, before we get to Anders, there is a question from the chat do flatter arched instruments have less formants, formants than higher arched instruments? Um, no, uh, no, I don't think that matters. It, it's it, it's um, less. If anything, uh, uh, 
it, it's just the arch in the island area. So a, a, a really abrupt arch there would might make it more stiff. But actually, really high arched instruments are, are not so much more curved in the middle. It's it's more outside the f holes where there's a rather abrupt thing. So you know, yeah. What is happening in this bridge hill? You, you can imagine just getting hold of the bridge and rotating it in your hands. How stiff does the top feel when driven like that? That's the thing. That's the way to feed your intuition to answer that question. If you could just get, you know, put a, put a wrench on the bridge and move it, how stiff would it feel? That's the element of the top plate behavior that matters. Now, what do you think? Uh, the thickness in the island air will make it will make a difference. Thicker plates will do less bending. A heavier bar will do less bending. But the arching it affects the details. But this bit between the F's is going to be able to deform pretty much for with any arching. It'll always be there, and it wouldn't sound like a violin if it wasn't there. If you put your holes somewhere altogether different so you haven't got these slots making the island that might make a big difference uh, but as long as it more or less looks like a violin um, with reference to marty kasprick um, it should behave it'll ha it'll have a formant but it may be higher or lower in frequency you may have more than one i've seen instruments that seem to have i mean these people would go the more ultra lightweight you go, the more likely you are to push that formant lower in frequency. And, and you do you see those differences. It, it, it will be one of the things that makes a difference. And say, I've just talked about this one resonance in the island area. The, it, it could have more than one. Colin Goff has written a little paper about this. So you could have more than one feature of that kind. And I've certainly measured one violin. I think it's one of Sam Zygmuntovich's violins, which we had an input admittance from, and that definitely seemed to have two peaks. But we didn't have enough data to find out what he's done. But it's obviously worth paying for. All right, um, Anders? Yeah. Uh, my question is maybe related to the former one. I was wondering if, uh, uh, if there is a simple model to explain what the the uh, center of the top does to the bridge hill. Does it become pointier with stiffer top, or what? what is there any model to? Um, uh, I, I, I have written about this in the past. So the, 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 there are plots answering that question in a paper I wrote a few years ago, which, if you have about the bridge hill, um, okay. the main thing is that you shift the frequency. Most okay. of the adjustments you think of doing um, make it more stiff or less stiff, more heavy or less heavy, and so you shift the frequency. But there are things that could make a difference to how high it is and how, how broad it is, yes. Um, just off the top of my head, I can't remember what exactly what those plots say, but there is something, anyone, anyone interested in that, just email me offline and I'll send you a PDF of that. I don't... I don't think that one, let me just have a look. Sorry, I'm just looking in my browser. Um, is that one available? Oh, it's online. No, 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 no I'm reading the wrong one, sorry. Um, um, let me just, um, I've lost the Zoom window. Um, I have a publication. If you find my publication list on my yes. university website, um, it's on the bridge field, isn't it? Yeah, wh wherever I'm allowed to, I've put the um, PDFs there free to download. Some journals really, really don't like you doing that. I'm just looking at the list, trying to see that one, but I can't. I can see the one about A naught. Yeah, Jim, I think we should move it, on. It is, to it the is there. Question. Number 78. Find my, find my publication list. Number 78. You can grab the PDF. All right. Let's, let's try to. Let's try to get to more questions and Andy. Well, I just have a, a, a comment and a question for Jim. The first I wanted to just follow up on, on Jim's comment Jim about repeatability. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm very interested in and I have a student right now doing what you suggested, uh, measuring the 
admittance on on consecutive days or every other day for, yep. for over a couple of weeks to see if we can actually develop a way of quantifying the variability. It's like, can we put an error bar to our admittance mm -hmm. measurements of some sort? And the reason we're interested in this is because we want to try to study the, um, not comparing different violins, but the same violin over time, trying to really get a good grip on this idea of playing in a, a violin. Does an instrument improve in some way or change in some way in a measurable way from the time that it's new okay. to after it's been played for a while? So I've got some, contact me offline because I'd be interested in that. I've done a similar thing over years. So I could show you another example of a violin that I've measured over a period of 20 years. I'd love to Just see that. Of interest. Yeah. So yeah, good. ping me offline. Speaking of subtle measurements or subtle changes, you know, I, I anticipate subtle changes, so I want to get an understanding of how just repeatability. Um, can... Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the, the question then is, is bridge admittance, uh, for what I'm trying to do at least, would it be any better or different to measure, say, a transfer admittance from bridge to some point on the on the top plate versus the bridge itself? Is there any advantage just to doing the bridge admittance? The, the, the virtue of bridge admittance is that it is definitely useful for some questions you might want to ask. It's the only thing the string knows. So in, in as a first guess, anything that affects the playability of the instrument, the, the, the string only knows about what the body is doing through the bridge. So it, it, it definitely is relevant to a bunch of things. Now, it's not directly relevant to what it sounds like. And no single structural measurement is going to capture that. So um, I, I would go for bridge admittance. And I also wouldn't do a transfer admittance for a technical reason. The, um, you, um, for some of these subtle questions, phase is important. And that's the hardest thing to get right in a measurement. If you do a transfer admittance, you don't really know what the answer should be. If you do a point admittance, then you look at the real part of it and it should be all positive. Mm. As soon as you see that drifting into the negative, you know you've got a time delay or something in your measuring system. So it has a kind of built in um, idiot proofing check. And that's a good thing. Okay. All Thanks. right. So final question from Oded. Oded, you're muted. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself, Oded? Ah, there we go. Okay. All right. You got me. Thank you very much, Jim. Nice to see you all. Um, Jim, I'm wondering if you have uh, ever examined uh, the subject of modal density uh, in instruments in the, in the uh, spectrum analysis. Good question. The short answer is yes. Um, it, uh, um, for the explaining yeah it's an interesting thing yeah yes i've written something about that um to explain to this broad audience why modal density will be interesting is probably more than fan wants me to do but if you go to the euphonics thing i mean particularly for the banjo the some of the very distinctive features of the banjo are precisely because a, a, a drum skin has a very different modal density behavior than any wooden plate so it, it, it's absolutely an interesting um, question to ask. And the starting point for science is always to look for an easy question first. And so com mm. comparing the banjo with the guitar makes a nice clear cut comparison because you get big, big differences directly attributable to modal density. And that, it's, um, that's all written up on you. There... Have a look at that and ping me, ping me messages. We can chat offline. Is there any structural element in the violin that influences um, modal density? Not very much is really the answer. A a anything based on plates will always on average. So anything to do with plate vibration produce contributes is on average a constant modal density. Stuff to do with the air inside has a modal density which starts low but gets rapidly higher and that's why i wouldn't use collins internal measurement for high frequencies because it's there's a whole forest of internal air modes that probably don't matter for anything else but which swamp that measurement if you do it inside 
Um, so is it... Uh, uh, arching is makes it, a uh, difference. Arch, arching may... Flat plates are, are different from curved things. That makes a difference to the modal density. The, uh, arching makes things more stiff and it changes the behavior, makes the modes more sparse at low frequency. Hmm. So, Oded, And I, so is it... Um, Oded, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to, unfortunately, cut you off because um, we have a schedule to, to meet 